Honorable Professor Alferov, Mr. Moravitz, Chairman of the Board of Directors, International Peace Foundation, Chantelli Uranabe, First Vice President of Kashikot Bank, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great privilege for the Honorable University to collaborate with the International Peace Foundation in hosting the Bridges Dialogues towards a Culture of Peace series of lectures. The lecture we are proud to present today entitled Future Energy, Solar Energy Conversion by Professor Soares Alferov is but one of a series of over 100 of lectures and dialogues, seminars, workshops, as well as artistic performances that have taken place since the end of last year. These activities have attracted a large following from within the academic circle, as well as the public at large, and many of them have also been made possible in Thailand through the sponsorship of Kasukon Bank. This piece cannot be defined as the essence of war, but as a notion that involves all segments of society. This program of events is geared towards reflecting the International Peace Foundation's multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach towards promoting a culture of peace. As Nobel laureate for physics, whose preliminary research in the area of three five semiconductor heterostructures, development of laser solar cells, LEDs and epitaxy processes has led to the creation of modern heterostructure physics and electronics. Professor Alferov's contributions are definitely a creative pathway towards achieving peace through science and technology. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to our distinguished speaker, Professor Zoris Alferov, not only for the lecture he is about to deliver, but also for providing the opportunity for fellow Thai scientists and educators to avail of his expertise and insight as someone who has devoted his entire professional life to improving the quality of life in the area of physics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. of the International Peace Foundation, to present us with these remarks. ขอสนับสนุนทั้งแนวคิดเรื่องศิลปะและวิทยาที่จะได้มาซึ่งศิลปะนั้นแต่ความรู้ว่าเราแรกศิลปะเพื่อการสร้างสรรค์และเราแร
และนำทางนักวิทยาศาสตร์ผู้อาศัยศาสนาเท่านั้นอาจต้องทำงานร่วมกันด้วยเหตุนี้ความการสารสัมพันธ์สู่สันติวัฒนธรรมจึงเป็นชุดหอเหตุการณ์ที่ผู้คนทุกสาขาอาชีพได้มาพบกันในกิจกรรมงานทางสาขาเพื่อค้นหาทางออกที่สร้างสรรค์ดอปัญหาทั้งหลายและเพื่อสร้างสรรค์สันติภาพทั้งสันติภาพในตัวเราสันติภาพในครอบครัวของเราสันติภาพในความสร้างสรรค์ตนสันติกับธรรมชาติและสิ่งแวดล้อมสันติภาพระหว่างประเทศระหว่างวัฒนธรรมและศาสนาสันติภาพเป็นกระบวนการการสารสัมพันธ์ก็เป็นกระบวนการซึ่งไม่อาจเสร็จได้โดยฉบับหากต้องอาศัยเวลาด้วยเหตุผลนี้กรมการสารสัมพันธ์สุสานวัฒนธรรมจึงไม่ใช่การจัดประชุมเพียงครั้งเดียวเมื่อจบไปแล้วก็แลกกันไปแต่เป็นชุดของเหตุการณ์ภายในเวลาหนึ่งปีโดยเชิญผู้ได้รับการมาโนเวอร์สาขาสันติภาพพิเศษแห่งนี้ทั้งแพทย์วรรณกรรมและเศรษฐศาสตร์จำนวนถึงสิบสี่ท่านมาสร้างสถานศาสตร์สัมพันธ์กับผู้นาในด้านดังการของสังคมไทยและกับสาธารณชนเมื่อได้จัดกิจกรรมมาแล้วหกสิบครั้งมีผู้เข้าร่วมงานทั้งสิบกว่าสองร้อยสองร้อยคนเราได้รับการติดต่อโดยเฉพาะจากนักเรียนนักศึกษาและเยาวชนที่ได้รับแรงบันดาลใจจากเนื้อหาของกิจกรรมเหล่านั้นพวกเขาต้องการมีส่วนร่วมอย่างแข่งขันในกระบวนการสร้างสัมพันธ์สู่สันติซึ่งจะตากไว้กับชนชนาเยังไม่กี่คนคนของไปได้หากต้องการการมีส่วนร่วมของทุกทุกคนดังนั้นเราจึงขอให้ท่านช่วยเราและสนับสนุนเราเราจึงจึงขอให้ท่านช่วยสักถามและสนับสนุนช่วยชี้แนะและชี้นำในกระบวนการสารสัมพันธ์สู่สันติพร้อมขอบคุณพนันธ์ปณิรชนประธานที่ประสาทไฟไทยพร้อมกองการสารสัมพันธ์สู่สันติวัฒนธรรมคนบรรทุนทั้งสามและพนักงานกสิกรแบงไทยพร้อมรองศาสตราจารย์ประชาสมิธและชุดหลอกการมหาวิทยาลัยตลอดจนผู้สนับสนุนและผู้อุดมร่วมงานทุกคนที่ได้ให้ความร่วมมือด้วยโดยเฉพาะท่านศาสตราจารย์สุรศักดิ์ปรพซึ่งได้เดินทางมาอย่างประเทศไทยและให้การสนับสนุนกิจกรรมนี้ดอยไม่มีค่าดอกแห่งใดๆไม่จากนี้ไปท่านจะกรุณาแสดงบัตรประชาพิเศษอันเป็นส่วนสำคัญของการสัมพันธ์สาสัมพันธ์สู่สันติวัฒนธรรมเป็นเรื่องของการวิจัยเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิงเชิง
development of lasers, solar cells, LEDs, and new taxi processes has led to the creation of modern heterostructure physics and electronics. In 1988, he was appointed dean of the Faculty of Physics and Technology at the St. Petersburg Technical University. And since 1983, he has been vice president of the Russian Academy of Science and president of the St. Petersburg Science Center. Professor Soros Alperov has earned various national and international awards and is an honorary member of numerous universities and scientific organizations around the globe. He has published many books, articles, and inventions on semiconductor physics and technology, and his editor is editor in chief of the Russian journal Technical Physics Letter. And now, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let us hear from our distinguished speaker, Professor Soros I. energy carriers, you can see that oil 
which is one of the main one of the main source of energy right now. And we know that there's the war going on in order to get some new places where the oil can be uh, produced. It's only 40, 50 years with the consumption rates which exist right now. Maybe there would be discovered some new sources of energy. If you look to gas, and Russia is one of the biggest gas production over the world, it's 60, 70 years. Okay, coal, it's much more, three, four hundred years, but there are plenty of ecological problems here by using the coal. Nuclear power at the beginning of century, when just it was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovery of radioactivity, it started the conversation, consideration about nuclear power in the future. After the discovery fusion of uranium, uh, it started to become practical one, but of course, first of all, it was concentrated for nuclear weapon, and from the important program, Manhattan program in the United States, then Soviet nuclear program for nuclear weapon, it practically started in 1954, the first nuclear energy station in the Soviet Union, in the small city of not very far from Moscow. But nuclear power station, the main direction of the development of nuclear power station work connected with using of the thermal neutron reactors. Uh, and in this case, only 120 years it exists, can be used uranium for nuclear power station. Of course, the fast reactors practically uh, in an exhaust if it can be used many, many years, but still up to now, in spite that the first fast reactors were created approximately about 40 years ago, it's still not so a lot of technological problems, especially materials problems, and it's very complicated to answer the question. Uh, if it would be a reliable source of energy or not. Of course, the Chernobyl tragedy played a very negative role in the development of nuclear power energy, uh, and there are really a lot of ecological problems connected with this source of energy. If you look, for instance, this data I took from our Ministry of Atomic Energy, which definitely uh, strongly in favor of using the nuclear power station. And if you look to that, and this is just a prediction of the total energy <coughs> consumption increasing in the 21st century. And even the ministry which is working in the favor of uh, atomic energy, there is a prediction of uh, cutting down the energy production after middle of this century by using nuclear power energy. In different situation, then you can use fast reactors. But what I said before, there are plenty of problems. First of all, material problem, but this material problem can be became just principal problem for development of the nuclear energy production based on using fast reactors. Of course, there is another source of energy which connected with the sun, certain nuclear energy. 
Thermo nuclear reactor Tokamak, which must to go to operation a few years later, maybe in 2007, maybe in 2008. Right now is a problem which place to choose for construction of this uh, Tokamak system. It was proposed a long time ago. In 1951, two great Russian scientists, academicians Igor Tam and Andrei Sakharov, proposed the magnetic nuclear thermonuclear reactor, which later became got the name Tokamak. So this system of the energy production exists more than 50 years. And I remember when our great scientists, the formal and informal leader of all nuclear research in the Soviet Union, the head of our nuclear weapon program, Igor Vasilievich Kurchatov, took the initiative to open research in the area of thermonuclear reaction because it was secret in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in the Soviet Union. And during the visit to the United Kingdom, together with leaders of our country, Khrushchev and Bulganin, in 1956, Igor Kurchatov delivers a lecture about research in Russia for using of the thermonuclear reactors. It started, it just took out the secrecy for this kind of research, and this became international program. And in 1957, there was, I think, the first international conference of this subject. After this conference, the friend of Porchata, the leader of the United Kingdom program, Nobel Laureate, John Cochran, who got Nobel Prize before the war for the nuclear research. And just after this conference, John Cochran and the press conference was held by journalists when the thermonuclear reactors became the real source of energy with big industrial applications. And John Cochrane answered in 20 years. Seven years later, on the same international conference, the same press conference, and journalists asked him again when thermonuclear reactors became to produce energy in industrial scale production. And John Cochran answered in 20 years. Journalists asked him, look, we asked you seven years ago, we answered in 20 years. And today, after seven years, you again answer in 20 years. And John Cochran said, just look, I don't change my mind. It's a lot of complicated problems, a lot of problems were solved, and this picture just showed the ITER reactor, international thermonuclear program. Uh, a lot of work has been done in Russia, in Japan, in other countries, in the United States, and what I said before, in 2007, maybe 2008, it start experimental work of this reactor, maybe five, six years later, we can got some first important results. And maybe, if you ask right now, the experts in thermonuclear reactors, in thermonuclear program, when this kind of energy production start to work in industrial scale production, the answer would be approximately 50 years. So now 
they changed the life. <coughs> this is artificial estimation how would we change the source of energy which has been done by International Energy Agency in 30 years, from year 2000 to the year of 2007. If you look at these pictures, you can see that practically It not be changes. It practically is the same oil, the same is gas, the same is coal, a little bit decreasing is nuclear power, and <coughs> double increasing other sources. And in other sources, the main part of the energy production is solar energy conversion. The semiconductor physics, physics and semiconductor physics we are working in this direction many, many years. This is Akademishan Yok, the founder of our Yok Institute and really the founder and pioneer of the semiconductor research, systematical semiconductor research. I remember when I first time attended the International Semiconductor Physics Conference. It happened in 1958, and the conference was in Czechoslovakia. And the open plenary session, the invited talks were delivered by Jokwe and Nobel Prize winner William Shockley. And the closing session, the invited talks were delivered by John Bardeen, the greatest scientist, the person who is only one who got two Nobel Prizes in physics, and Soviet physicist recognition Wool. And John Bardeen said in his speech that the science is international. It's very well known and understood by scientists but it's necessary to tell every time, everywhere, to the general public. Semiconductor physics is also international branch of science, and if you look when and how this branch of science has been created, he said it was created by Wilson and Moss in the United Kingdom, Wagner and Schott in Germany, and Yoko and Franklin in the Soviet Union. Academician Yoko was strongly in favor of the using photoelectrical solar energy conversion. When, in 1938, two his graduate students, uh, Kalamits and Maslakades, created CERNA uh, sulfur thallium photocells with the efficiency 1%, Academician Yoko proposed to build uh, buildings with the roofs covered with photocells. Right now we know that there exist big programs, 100,000 roof, solar cells roof in Germany. 800,000 roof in the United States and 1 million the program in Japan. But of course, like in many other branches of science and technology, the real changes came from some kind of special kind of application. The situation will change when, in 1954, three physicists from Bell Telephone Laboratory, Gerald Pearson, Chaplin and Fowler, created silicon pin junctions for the cells with the efficiency 6%. And because it was the time when Soviet Union and the United States carried out very strong program 
for space program. And of course, this space program were connected first of all with military goals. So it's just a picture how we can look through the same semiconductor solar cells, silicon solar cells, to the Earth in space. And the, one of the first Russian satellites, Sputnik 3, launched in 1958, used the solar batteries, solar cells, as a main source of energy. Then, of course, the solar energy conversion was developed, first of all, by space applications. For instance, in 1971, it was launched one of the very big for that time space station salute in our country. How big this was, you can look just from the picture how it looks inside. When we start to develop three five compounds, gallium arsenide, which can work at high temperature, the first application we are again in space. It's Russian moon car Munako, launched in 1970, in solar array, four meters square, based on Goma Junction, gallium arsenide solar cells. Approximately at the beginning of 70s, it started strong development of the photoelectrical power conversion, uh, solar energy conversion, by using semiconductors. And it was pushed forward by the energy crisis of the beginning of the 70s. In 1974, when it was the peak of energy crisis, which was not real energy crisis, it was connected first of all with the prizes which were established for oil by OPEC organization. But it started real energy crisis for the people. Uh, and it was created United States program for development of solar energy conversion from 74 for 25 years, I think, if I remember. But the goals of this program we are not achieved even now. But this energy crisis stimulated to took the main attention in the solar energy conversion to uh, terrestrial education, not to space. And it was very important. And at the beginning, it just arose the program which material the best one for solar energy conversion. There is just the efficiency uh, which you can get for PN junction solar cells, one PN junction solar cells, by using the, the different materials. Uh, you can see that silicon is good enough, but much better gallium arsenide and cadmium telluride. But it always played very important role, some kind of previous development of technology and economic problems, in spite of the gallium arsenide, much better from the point of, of the efficiency, but technology got developed first of all for silicon, and it was for space application, it started big scale production. So silicon became the main material for terrestrial applications for solar energy conversion. I very like this picture that just which shows the application of the solar energy conversion, mobile refrigerator for medicines with solar panels, yeah, put on the camel. From the beginning, it just appeared the problems of using different materials. There was big progress for solar batteries made on amorphous silicon in the 80s. But the efficiency was not so promising 
there are very a lot of problems with degradation. So it exists working mostly for toys as a solar energy sources for some kind of uh, devices like watches, small calculators and so on. Then of course it was plenty of work have been done with other modification of silicon, polycrystalline silicon, which much more uh, not so much expensive as crystalline silicon. But right now, after a long time of the development of the solar energy conversion system based on silicon, we can say again that semiconductor crystalline silicon is for terrestrial applications, not only for space, is the best material. The efficiency which has been achieved right now, the record efficiency is about 23-24%, but typical efficiency for big scale production is between 15 to 16 percent for solar cells and a little bit more than 10 percent for the models of the um, uh, solar batteries. Some changes in this area started after discovery of the semiconductor heterostructures. There is just fundamental physical phenomena in classical heterostructures, which we call as classical when the main sizes of the heterostructure don't use and do not appear the quantum size phenomena. The one-side injection, super-injection effect, A and C, became the basis for the development of new kind transistors and lasers, which became much more efficient than Roman junction transistor and lasers. As the picture B, it's just a first theoretical consideration of this graded heterostructure where the movement of the charge carriers, electrons and holes, became not due to diffusion, but due to inside electric field, which called frequently quasi-electric fields. This phenomenon has been considered in the middle of the 50s by that time very young Professor Herbert Kremer, with whom we share the Nobel Prize in 2000. And this graded structure can be used effectively for solar energy conversion too but it not became the real uh, base for solar batteries up to now. I will say it was about that later. And just upper better junction between two different materials with different forbidden gap, the picture D became much more efficient because the sun absorbed exactly on the place where it divided electrons and poles and created photo uh, electrical uh, power. Like in the case of silicon, the first development of solar batteries based on getter structure started in space. We created our first solar cells based on getter structures in 1917, and in 1974, we started to use them for military satellites in our space programs. And then, in 1986, it was launched the big space station Mir, which we worked approximately not approximately, exactly, 15 years. And the main source of energy there was gallium aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide solar relays with total area of 70 square meters. If you look right now to the contraction of the solar batteries based on gallium aluminum arsenide structure, it looks like that. 
and there are plenty of improvements due to development of new technology. First of all, the new technological methods like molecular vivid textile growth and especially metal organic chemical vapor depositions, now which produce plenty of very efficient industrial equipment for these goals. And in sufficiently short time, we came to understand that if you make comparison for terrestrial applications between silicon and three-fired compounds based on heterostructures, where in principle the efficiency much higher because theoretically for some kind of heterostructures the efficiency can be in principle 86%. It's the theoretical limit of the efficiency for some kind of ideal heterostructure solar battery. The theoretical limit in principle of the photoelectric uh, method of solar energy conversion is 93% which determined uh, <coughs> by carbon cycle. But um, the price for gallium aluminum arsenide materials and silicon quite different. And to get gain in this case, you can get only by using strong concentration level of the sun on the semiconductor cells. Because in this case, the uh, surface of the semiconductor uh, expensive material is small part because you can use the concentration ratio 100 and even 1000. On this picture you can see uh, estimated cost for the concentrator photovoltaic systems along concentration ratio. The red color is cell cost, the green model cost. You can see that in the case of Concentration ratio of 1,000, the cell cost is nothing. And the cost of the energy production became much lower. At the beginning of this kind of research in the end of 70s, we created special type of photo cell which specially can be used at very high concentration level. So it's unusual for the cells because it's very powerful for solar cells with the photocurrent 10, 20, 50 amperes per centimeter square. Even at the level of the concentration more than 5,000, it was still uh, about 20% the efficiency of this kind of solar cells. So we created the experimental systems based on that by using the mirrors concentration system. This only 18 photo cells like this one and these 18 photo cells produce 200 volts of electric power. Then it was developed the system is concentration by Fresnel lens, which is much more convenient and reliable. And right now, for instance, by using concentration, uh, solar cells, yellow molecular Martian and Petra structure, the efficiency we achieve 25% for the model area of 200 cm square and near to 23% for 600 cm square. This result was achieved by strong cooperation between Yoko Institute and Brown Walker Institute in private. If you consider just principally how you can increase the efficiency of the solar cells because 
Islam is the way to make solar energy conversion based on semiconductor solar cells compared from economic point of view to other sources of energy. There is just two pictures, one what we call Ebra Getter Junction and second Great Getter Junction. What is the main source of the losses in any kind of solar energy conversion based on semiconductor materials? It's mostly determined by a very simple mechanism. The, solar, the sun has spectrum wide enough with the maximum of energy in green area of spectrum. And when the sunlight goes to To semiconductor, why you have this kind of uh, changing of the efficiency? When the semiconductor has small permitting gap, practically most of the sunlight would be absorbed, but the photoelectric uh, potential which can be produced, electromotive power, it just the maximum corresponds to the permitted gap of the semiconductor. So, big part absorption and small level of electric power, electric, electromotive power. When it's wide gap material, okay, it can produce uh, photoelectric potential much bigger, but most of the light would become <coughs> through this semiconductor without absorption. If you have graded getter structure, because the main mechanism of the losses in semiconductor cells that high energy photons created high energy electrons and holes. Then they thermalize to the conduction band and valence band, and this is just the losses. If you use just graded getter structure, the electrons and holes created exactly on the same place where it would be divided in order to create what the electrical electromotive power. So from this point of view, it's very important it was just to show that you can use graded getter structure for production of the uh, photoelectric power. It's a very old experiments in our laboratory, 1978, when we show for PP gallium aluminum arsenide structure without PN junction, the possibility to have photovoltage up to difference of the forbidden gap in great structure. From this point of view, you must have much more efficient conversion of the solar sun to the uh, electric power. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when you use this structure, it drastically increases the internal resistance. In principle, you can create the most efficient with the theoretical value up to 86% photocells based on this principle. But the material for this kind of goals not exists right now. The material must have special properties, like, for instance, to have big variation of the forbidden gap, but mobility of the electrons and poles, like in small band gap materials, like, for instance, Mercury telluride. So another compromise for solution of this kind of problem is just to use many junction photocells one after another one. So the light going on with, through the photocell with big forbidden gap, 
Zan, Zen, the hottest cell is smaller forbidden gap. And you can realize by the steps in principle the same principle. It was realized, first of all, for dumber photocells, we just changed drastically efficiency from 24 27% to 32-33% by working together uh, Yoko Institute, Boeing and Brown Water Institute in Germany. And Right now, it exists a possibility to drastically increase the efficiency by using four water cells with different forbidden gap. Uh, this research carried out very intensively, and we can, to get practically in very short time, the water cells with the efficiency approximately 40-45%. What is also very important, that these many junction water cells can work at high concentration level. If you look just what happened in <coughs> three fives semiconductor heterostructure research, you can look from this picture when it was created the first common junction gallium arsenide photocells, then the getter structure to here, and how it developed much more effectively right now. If you look just in the history of the development of the getter structure solar cells, you can see here the yours and efficiency. Now we have more than 30 by using more complicated structures. Just simple heterostructure, uh, very thin layer heterostructure, and then multi junction heterostructures. So you can see that 40 45 percent you can wait in some short time. Uh, there is, of course, a principle the problem, 3-5 compounds always would be more expensive than silicon. But when you use concentration of light and modern technology based on uh, metal organic chemi chemical vapor depositions, the price for electric power of the photocells in this case became less than in case of silicon. It developed now quite intensively. You can see 9, 900 megawatt power how we distribute between different companies which produce photocells. It's interesting to just to uh, to say that the biggest oil companies became the producers of the solar batteries for solar energy conversion. If you look how it was developed between different countries, Europe in general, Japan, United States, you see the leader is Japan. And if you look to the predictions, just absolutely official one, which do not take into account some kind of drastic changes and breakthrough in the development of the technology, which from the development which exists right now, you can uh, anticipate it. So, in 2030, the production of the photoelectric power, just the evolution of this production by usual development of technology which exists right now, 
would be 140 gigawatts. I should like to say that this uh, level of the power, 140 gigawatts, corresponds to the full electric power production in Russia right now. And if you look to the possible development of the semiconductor photocells or photoelectric power conversion, so the blue is the system which exists right now based on crystallized silver. The anticipated price for watt of energy is 3.50 cents for one watt. Thin films, which is developing, developing a lot in, in the past and still developing right now, in principle, can give the level uh, about one dollar. And what we call right now behind the horizon, and this is connected with the semiconductor heterostructures multiply junction cells, so it can be between 20 to 10 watts uh, cents per watt. This goes, of course, you must be uh, careful about this kind of prediction. This goes about 20, 30 cents per watt. Uh, we predicted in 1974 when the first program of the photoelectric power conversion we are created in the United States. In general, I should like to say a few comments that this price for, even the price about one dollar per watt, absolutely comparable with the price for a nuclear power station. I can say that nuclear power station energy production became a reality, first of all, due to military programs of the nuclear weapons. In the human being history, it's frequently happened that military applications determine the peaceful application, user and development of some kind of peaceful technology. If, for instance, I am absolutely sure, due to some things, the Manhattan Project and Soviet Project for creation of nuclear weapons wouldn't be exist, we were still speaking about nuclear energy consumption as the dreams of the people in some long time future. Definitely, from a general point of view, because the global change of the climate is going on, because the ecological problems became more and more important, the solar energy conversion is only one method of the energy production without pure and clean from ecological point of view, and without what we call uh, it's not uh, make any it's not change any thermal equilibrium on our planet and from this point of view it's very attractive and promising the main problem is of course economic problem in general, people who is against of the solar energy conversion were speaking that the level of the energy from the sun is small enough. It's only about one kilowatt per centimeter square in south latitudes. So you must take big amount of Earth surface for this kind of goals. 
But very simple calculations show that in case, for instance, 20% of the efficiency of the solar cells and they don't cover all energy consumption in the United States, you must use for these goals about bit, a little bit more than 1% of the United States territory. So it's no problem from this point of view. Another problem, very important one, is economic one. And if there would be developed which practically the changes are became very important in last years, the new efficient solar cells based on heterostructure with using of the high concentration level, it really would be absolutely competitive with other sources of energy. And from the point of view of Chagrin laser, uh, you have in this case uh, the source of energy which can cover uh, the consumption of energy in our planet practically for thousands and thousands of years. So I hope that one of them real steps for development of this would be strong international cooperation of many countries for solution of this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Inspiring us with your expertise in physics. I believe now our audience might have some questions or comments to make and allow me to proceed with the question and answer session. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and put on a piece of paper. I'll start to uh, pick it up. Uh, while we wait, I think I have a question uh, to ask myself. Um, as you uh, achieved um, four books, four hundred articles, and fifty inventions on the semiconductor yourself, and not to mention uh, the Nobel Prize that you won. Uh, what would be your advice for us young scientists um, to follow your footsteps? Just repeat to me uh, your question. The question is, uh, what advice would you give uh, for young scientists to follow your footsteps? To follow my footsteps? Um, I think the advice what I can give you is not connected with heterostructures, and solar cells, and modern semiconductor electronics. I think the main thing for young people, students, who like to become scientists, and just to have interest for science, and to work hard. I think uh, it must be became the main problem in your life just to do research. When I am speaking with young people and young students in our institute, and especially because in last decades the prestige of the science and scientific career in our country decreased. And maybe not only in our country, I am usually speaking that the scientists, junior scientists, who is working in physics, chemistry, biology, in natural science, the person much more important than president of any country. Because the president country can solve just some problems of this country, or just a few countries or even many countries. But scientists who discover the new phenomenon and study this phenomenon, he is just staying together with God. He is a person who just discovered new problems.
which has cosmic scales and really uh, I'm, I'm not believer in God but I'm saying who is standing together with God uh, when I was speaking about solar energy conversion sometimes I'm saying why during so long time the problem of thermonuclear approach for energy production not solved up to now. Uh, I strongly believe that they will help to create nuclear weapons. But God not objected to do so because during the Manhattan project, American scientists, it was really international team, were created nuclear weapon because they were afraid that Hitler would be made to say. When Russian scientific team created Soviet nuclear weapon, they created this for peace goal, for peace, because there must be equilibrium and mostly due to existence of Soviet and American nuclear weapon programs, we have had only Cold War, but not the Hot War. And about thermonuclear reactions, maybe the God against to create star, the sun on the surface of Earth. Uh, but what you ask me the question, I should like to say again, you must have interest what you are doing, and remember always, the science is hard job, but if you love it, any hard job do not prevent you. In my case, when I was young, I frequently was slept in the laboratory for a long period of time because it was very interesting to start to work when everyone is get out and to work during the late evening and night. So it's just my advice. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a question from uh, engineers and uh, Mr. Scientists. Uh, concentrated cells, practical for rural application. For rural applications. Oh yes. The tracking is very simple. And it's took only just the some very small portion of the power which you produce. So it's not the, it's not the problem. Uh, the main problem in solar cell conversion, including, uh, including concentration cells and other types, technically it's accumulation of energy. It's much more important problem than Tracking, it's not the problem at all. Okay, I think this is a question from a student. Um, can you give a comment on thermal electric effect for solar energy conversion and are there any future? You see, from my mind, maybe I'm wrong, but from my point of view, uh, it can be used as additional one with high temperature solar energy conversion semiconductor materials. It not has any real uh, promising thing just as just as the method of solar energy conversion. But in the case of using high forbidden gap materials with high temperature ability of working, uh, thermovoltaic can be additional source of energy just to increase the cool efficiency. And of course it has some very important perspectives 
sometimes in space applications, in order to have the source of energy independent from the sun energy. Yeah. Yes, um, we've been talking about the efficiency of the solar cells. Um, what would you think would be your prediction of the maximum uh, viable uh, dual efficiency? No, I, I just told you in my lecture, the theoretical limit, what I call practical theoretical limit, which take into account some principle forces, which just impossible to avoid, is 86%. In the case of multi-junction photocells, for four-junction photocells, it's about 40-45%. For six eight junction, it would be 50-60. And it's important also that for this kind of multi-junction photocells, you use now the technology which were developed by us for semiconductor lasers with the most complicated device. But the same technology now, developing based, what I said, on the metal organic chemical vapor position. And technology, it does not matter. And it's not uh, playing an important role for increasing of the price. It doesn't matter how many semiconductor layers you use in photocells. One, two, three, hundred. It practically is the price for technology the same. And because it's very similar technology for multi-junction water cells, in this case, uh, the materials which you use, very small amount. So from the point of view of the uh, spending materials, it does not matter. It's the same price. Single heterostructure solar cells, tandem, or 10 junction solar cells. And in the case of 10 junction solar cells, the efficiency would be about 60%. Uh, principally, what I said, the gradient heterostructure, principally, the most promising, but not exist right now any material by using which you can realize the principal advantages of the gradient heterostructure. But technology we have developed so fast in the last 10, 15 years. So multi-junction water cells, the possibility of the application of which we considered at least 20 years ago or 25, now became reality. And many laboratories in the world are doing this kind of work and research. What is important in general is that international cooperation is going on strongly in this area. American, Germans, Spanish laboratories, our Russian laboratories at the Yoko Institute working together, carried out joint projects, and of course always needed the money for research. Thank you. Um, this is a question from a young student in the high school and he would like to know uh, whether biomaterial uh, bio uh, such as chlorophyll uh, can be used to convert the sun energy uh, into a chemical energy and then change the chemical energy into electrical energy. Is it possible? No, in principle, yes. The problem is what kind of efficiency you would have right now. The biological method of by using some kind of biological materials, yes, yes, of course. But the efficiency is very low, but it's very interesting area for research. Okay, thank you. Um, I think due to time constraint, we have one last question here on the commercial aspect. Okay, um, is there any attempt by the big oil or motor companies to show any research of solar energy interest? Oh yes, definitely. I said that during my lecture, if you look to the uh, solar cells production, the biggest uh, oil companies became the biggest solar cells production producers. Uh, but of course, 
you see uh, the psychology of the uh, owners of different kind of companies strongly different from the psychology of scientists because they are looking always just for profit and profit right now and very seldom unfortunately they can develop long time programs i remember for instance when energy crisis happened in the united states it just immediately a few big oil companies created special research centers for semiconductor materials for investigations of the photocells and so on i'm up here from uh, Chicago, Exxon, and so on. When the situation a little bit changed after five, ten years, they closed this kind of research. Uh, but when the time would be go more and more, I am absolutely sure uh, they start to understand that more and more. I remember that Mr. Fedorkovsky, before he came to the trial, he asked me, what is the situation now with photoelectric solar energy conversion? I told to him, uh, and told to him that it's necessary to just to organize some kind of research and activity in this direction. So, I think it's, it will happen. Okay, this is one last uh, question. Uh, it's a very interesting one. As far as the environmental is concerned, analyzed by the life cycle assessment, do you think PV electrification is still feasible and viable? Just repeat to me, I'm not um, As far as the environmental environment is concerned, yeah. analyzed by the life cycle assessment of the solar panel, do you think PV electrification is still feasible and viable? And viable? Uh, I don't just understand the sense of the question. What it means, life sucks, the cycle system. I presume, from my understanding, maybe it's the waste that will generate from the life cycle using the solar panels and so on. Oh, from this, from this goes, it's no problem. No problem. Yes. It's one of the most prospective sources of the energy. Uh, in general, the the waste became very strong problems of the people, but it's not connected with the solar energy conversion. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I have uh, this uh, note uh, from the BBC News, Wednesday, 11th October 2000. It said, every time someone plays a compact disc or uses a mobile telephone, they are putting into practice technology pioneered by Dr. Alvaro. I think that sums up uh, Professor Alvaro's achievement. Okay, before the conclusion of the lecture, in order to express our deepest gratitude, may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Tachai Sumit, our president, to present a token of appreciation on behalf of Jamal Khan University to Professor Alvaro. We are pleased to invite you all to attend Professor Alvaro's lecture on future trends in electrical components for modern information technology at 2 p.m. at the conference room, second floor, building for faculty of engineering. I would like to express our deepest appreciation once again for the opportunity to learn about your expertise in physics and electrical junction semiconductor. Please join me in giving Professor Alvaro a big hand of the floor. Now, 
for a public announcement. Uh, to return the headphones, please drop them off in the return box in the exit. Uh, thank you very much. ผู้ที่เป็นคณะกรรมการนายกรรมการผู้นำนักเรียนที่ต้องพิจารณาในการทำงานครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับคร